should probably train more than the pro bodybuilders you follow. You should be training more than the pros, a lot more than what they actually train, and maybe a little bit more close to what they say they train. In this video, I'm going to debunk Dr. Mike Israel's why you should train more than the pros video. This is a lecture in which Mike advises that natural lifters in the general population should on average train more than pharmaceutically enhanced professional bodybuilders and strength athletes. If you don't know who Mike Israel is, he's a pharmaceutically enhanced amateur bodybuilder who makes YouTube videos mainly about how natural lifters should train and eat to gain muscle and strength. A full exposition of Mike's terrible advice would be a mammoth undertaking. And while I've considered doing it, I think better would be to carry out the same task piecemeal by addressing Mike's bad arguments one by one, each in separate videos. We can consider this video the first installment in that series. Here's how I'll structure this video. First, I'll outline Mike's argument. Second, I'll examine how the pros actually train, since this isn't something Mike does in his video. Third, I'll explain why Mike's argument is bad. And I'll conclude by outlining why you might want to be careful of Mike in the future. And as always, I've included timestamps in the description, so you can skip to whatever part of this video that interests you most. Mike argues that natural lifters in the general population should probably train more than the pros, by which he means pharmaceutically enhanced professional bodybuilders and strength athletes. When he says more, he means more volume and more frequency. So, if the pros do n sets of chest per week, then Mike would advise that you do more than n sets of chest per week. Likewise, if the pros train chest once per week, then Mike would rather that you train chest more than once per week. So whatever volume and frequency the pros are doing, you, as a natural lifter in the general population, should probably be doing more than that, according to Mike. You should probably train more than the pro bodybuilders you follow. That is, do more sets per workout potentially, and almost certainly do a higher frequency of training a given muscle. The rationale Mike gives is this. Number one, Mike argues that the pros are fast twitch dominant in their skeletal muscle mass, uh, which is a claim that, whether true or false, Mike doesn't support with any evidence, uh, which Mike argues makes any given hard set more stimulative of growth and harder to recover from. Two, Mike argues that because the pros are stronger than you, that makes any given hard set harder to recover from. Three, Mike argues that because the pros have more muscle mass than you, that makes any given hard set harder to recover from. Mike acknowledges that the pros might train less than they say they do. So he makes it clear that you should train more than the pros actually train, and close to, or even a bit more than how they claim they train. You should be training more than the pros, a lot more than what they actually train, and maybe a little bit more close to what they say they train, especially on per set, uh, per session volume. How many sets of, how many hard sets of chest, for example, they do in on a Monday. Mike pays lip service to the thought that pharmaceutical enhancement can let you recover from more training, which might be a reason not to train more than the pros. However, he argues that this recovery boost is offset by how big and strong the pros eventually become from their drug abuse, which makes any given hard set more difficult to recover from. So he argues that even though the pros abuse drugs, this isn't a sound reason not to train more than them. And the drugs increase your strength? and they increase your size. And those two things feed back in to reduce your volume requirements. Even though your recovery has come up, your volume requirements have come down because you're now bigger and stronger. So in the end, the drugs, if a, if a pro's been taking them for a few years, they kind of level out. And Mike also claims, I say claims since there's no real argument as such, that because the pros are all over the place with their level of effort per set, 
with some sets being taken to failure and others being nowhere near failure, you shouldn't train too much more than them. I'm sure Mike has his reasons, but he didn't provide them. The reps in reserve are a giant question mark. Sometimes it's total failure, sometimes it's like 10 reps in reserve. And it's like, that's a set today. I'm working on feel, bro. At a certain point in Mike's lecture, he introduces some latitude and argues that some pros have approaches too extreme to be considered. If they do three or fewer sets, or 20 or more sets per body part, per workout, then he says not to consider them. If the pros do 20, f them. If the pros do three, f them. Mike gives general volume and frequency recommendations. He encourages that you do five to 12 hard sets per body part, two to three times per week. You probably in general, want to stick at most times between five sets per session and 12 sets per session per muscle group. Most people will find their best results somewhere within there. If the pros train their chests twice, you could probably train your chest three times. If they train legs once, you could probably train legs twice. With the low end of that range being 10 sets per body part per week, still a considerable amount, a bit less than what most pros do, and a staggering 36 hard sets per body part per week on the high end. This range is consistent with Mike's overall argument, since, on average, it proposes that you do 21.25 hard sets per week, going by the mean figure of the range he gives, which is, if I had to guess, though I can't confirm this empirically, and neither can Mike, more than what most pros do. Mike's argument is superficially plausible. But with a closer examination, as with a lot of what he says, his argument turns out to be devoid of substance and supporting evidence. But before I explain why Mike's argument is unsound, I'll examine how the pros actually train in the next chapter of this video. Mike says you should probably train more than the pros, but he never describes how the pros actually train. Anyway, I will. So in this chapter, first, I'm going to look at the chest workouts of the six most recent Mr. Olympia winners. That's because Mr. Olympia isn't just any pro. He's the most successful pro within the parameters of the sport of competitive bodybuilding. And so looking at how the six most recent winners train chest, will provide a representative and not cherry-picked sample of how the pros actually train. Second, I'm going to touch on fundamental physiological differences between natural folks and enhanced folks that impact how each group should train. Then, we can decide if it's a good idea to do more than the pros. Derek Lunsford, 2023 Mr. Olympia in a chest workout published to YouTube on the 15th of May 2023, does 14 hard sets in total. Hadi Chupan, 2022 Mr. Olympia, does 20 hard sets for his chest in total in a workout published to YouTube on the 26th of November 2022. Next, we've got Mamdu Elzbiai, who won the title twice, better known as Big Rami. He does 24 hard sets in total, in a chest workout published to YouTube on the 3rd of November 2019. Brandon Curry, 2019 Mr. Olympia, does 20 hard sets in total, in a chest workout published to YouTube on the 30th of September 2021. Sean Roden, 2018 Mr. Olympia, may he rest in peace, I'm going to exclude from the tally, since I couldn't find a workout video of his, where the sets and reps are given. And last, but certainly not least, we have my good friend and seven-time Mr. Olympia winner, Phil Heath. Hey, Solomon Nelson. Hey, Phil. In a chest workout published to YouTube on the 9th of August 2020, although the workout footage itself is from the height of Phil's competitive career, he does the following. So that's 20 hard sets in total. It's also worth noting that Phil is joined by Jay Cutler, a four-time Mr. Olympia winner, who's doing the exact same chest workout. So we can include Jay in the tally. Excluding Sean Roden, for whom I couldn't find a credible workout plan, the mean number of sets in a chest workout among those Mr. Olympia winners is 20, 
with the fewest sets being done by Derek Lunsford at 14, and the most done by Big Rami with 24. If we choose not to count Big Rami on the basis that he does more than 20 sets per chest, which is Mike's arbitrary cutoff for when a pro's plan simply gets too crazy, then the mean figure is brought down to something like 19 sets. Bearing in mind that Mike argues that you should probably train more than what the pros actually do, and as much, if not even a bit more than what they say they do, then on that basis, the number of sets of chest per week that Mike would probably recommend for you is greater than or equal to 19 sets. You should be training more than pros, a lot more than what they actually train, and maybe a little bit more close to what they say they train, especially on per set, uh, per session volume. How many sets of, how many hard sets of chest, for example, they do in on a Monday. Here's what we know about the pros and how they train. They often follow body part splits, training five to six times per week. They do very high training volumes, as I outlined, with the average Mr. Olympia winner over the past decade doing around 20 sets of chest in one workout alone. The pros take so many exogenous hormones that they often drop dead, but that lets them recover from, and benefit from, more training. Further, the fact that they're enhanced means that their decisions in training matter far less than they would if they were natural, since pharmaceutical enhancement both raises your maximum recoverable training volume and lowers your minimum effective training volume, with one study showing that you grow in a dose-response manner when injecting testosterone while doing literally no training whatsoever. In other words, you can train very little, or you can train a lot, and you'll still grow plenty if you're taking enough crap. Additionally, the top pros have excellent bodybuilding genetics, which further contributes to their ability to get away with poor training decisions and still see incredible results. The pros have to be careful about avoiding injury from training in a way that naturals don't. That's because when you're pharmaceutically enhanced, the rate at which your muscles grow outpaces the adaptations in your joints and connective tissues. Further, since you're bigger and stronger in general while on gear, which Mike alludes to, a hard set of five on the barbell back squat looks very different when you're natural compared to when you're enhanced. Uh, whereas while naturals might be handling three to four plates aside, Reuters might be handling five to six plates aside, which is a much heavier and likely more injurious weight. So, pro bodybuilders who train with heavy weights, which is an effective and generally safe strategy for growth in naturals, often end up injured. And this is likely why many pros do high rep, short rest interval, pump and squeeze training with mainly machines. They're trying at all costs to avoid injury to promote their longevity in the sport of competitive bodybuilding. And besides, they're going to grow plenty regardless of how ineffectual their gym routines are due to their excellent genetics and drug abuse. So why risk lifting heavy? Or so say the smart ones at the top of the sport. So considering all of that, the way that Reuters train especially the top pros, should have rather little bearing on how naturals should train. Having clarified that, I'm going to explain why Mike's argument is so bad in the next chapter. I have two objections to Mike's argument that feed into each other. The first is that his advice is bad for most people. And my second objection is that his advice is questionable, even for what I can only assume is his intended audience, that is, healthy, young, experienced lifters seeking the best bodybuilding results possible. Mike has a huge audience of over one million people. I'd hazard a guess that 
most people in his audience aren't like me, or other advanced natural bodybuilders, in terms of being young, highly motivated individuals who have reached advanced to elite levels of strength after several years of hard, consistent training. Mike's audience is vast and diverse, comprising complete beginners, novices, intermediates, busy professionals, people with all the time in the world to train, teens, people over 60, people with a range of health conditions, people who attack each set with ferocious intensity, bludges and texters, etc. The fact that Mike spends absolutely no time in his lecture clarifying what his intended audience is, is irresponsible, since however applicable Mike's advice is for people like me, and we'll get to that, for most people watching Mike's videos, the advice to train more than the pros is terrible. Should an obese beginner who's just getting started in the gym train more than the pros? How about a 66-year-old recreational lifter? Should he or she train more than the pros? Should a time-pressed medical student, such as my lovely girlfriend, whom I've been training for several years, train more than the pros? Should someone who's susceptible to injury train more than the pros? Should someone who doesn't really like lifting, but still wants to see good results, train more than the pros? These are rhetorical questions, because the answer is obviously no. An obese beginner might get burnt out and injured training more than the pros, and would likely be better served training far less than the pros. Ditto the 66-year-old recreational lifter, and meanwhile, the busy professional simply doesn't have the time to train more than the pros. Ultimately, the approach that delivers the best result possible is contingent on many factors, factors which Mike spends no time outlining, such as advancement in training, motivation levels, time restrictions, and much more. And so the blanket statement that you should probably train more than the pros is false. A better statement is you should probably not train more than the pros. But is Mike's advice, charitably interpreted of course, true for any demographic? Say, for those of us who want the best results possible and are in a position to train more than the pros? I'll argue no. Unless we're talking about a truly microscopic demographic in the next section of this chapter. Let's say you're a young, highly motivated, early intermediate trainee who has lots of free time and wants to see the best result possible. Is it a good idea to train more than the pros? I'm going to argue no, and my argument will be based on a simple cost-benefit analysis. That is, I'll argue that, even for this demographic, there's likely a greater net benefit in training less than the pros compared to more than the pros. To support my argument, let's start with a simple truth. There's effectively a natty limit. That is, a point beyond which you can't see further gains in muscle and strength without pharmaceutical enhancement. And I say effectively because while there may not be a true limit as such to your natty gains, as it's become so popular for fitness YouTubers to argue, natty gains over time are definitely an asymptote. That is, they're exponentially diminishing. In other words, you have to train exponentially harder and exponentially smarter to see exponentially fewer gains over time to the point where the gains you make year by year are negligible, even with a highly optimized approach. How long before you reach this point is hard to say. Some say three to five years of proper training, with emphasis on the word proper. 
whether or not this specific three to five year figure is accurate, even though it does track with the experience of many natty bodybuilders, the overall idea of natty gains as an asymptote is sound. After all, if our adaptations to training weren't exponentially diminishing, then we could all expect to add 2.5 kilos to our 5x5 squats every week, infinitely. Uh, but sadly, human physiology just doesn't work that way. The gains slow down and eventually effectively run out. There comes a point where those 2.5 kilo jumps become very few and far between. So when you get the fundamentals in bodybuilding right, the question isn't if you reach your limit, but when. The end destination will be the same, whether it took you three to five years with a highly optimized approach, or five to ten years doing a mostly good approach, uh, but with some time spent messing about. So you're after the best results possible. Considering that Given enough time, the end destination is the same. We can analyze the costs and benefits of different approaches. We know what Mike's approach is. He suggests that you train more than the pros. I'm going to compare his approach to mine, which is probably what you'd get if you came to me for a consultation. And it's to chug along with a moderate and sustainable, but still effective amount of training. What are the benefits of Mike's approach compared to mine? Well, there's really only one. That is, if you can handle Mike's approach, then you might stand to grow marginally better and reach that point where your natty progress is negligible a bit sooner. This is a best case scenario, mind you. What are the costs of Mike's approach compared to mine? Well, they're numerous, and they're grave. Number one, you basically have to live in the gym, which can indirectly worsen your results through, for example, burnout and stress over not having time for important things outside of the gym, such as sleep, work, and time spent with loved ones, and also your quality of life in general. Two, you're at a higher risk of injury. That's because, for any given amount of training, there's a certain amount of risk. So, the more you do, the riskier things get. 3. You run a much higher risk of ruining your progress by doing too much and overtraining. And 4. You might sacrifice other important training variables for the sake of this silly goal to train more than the pros. For example, you might sacrifice appropriate proximity to failure and absolute intensity, exercise selection, optimal rest between sets, etc. Overall, Mike's approach seems quite bad, even if you're after the best results possible in the long term. Now let's look at the costs and benefits of my approach compared to Mike's. Here are the benefits. Number one, you don't have to live in the gym. Number two, you're at a lower risk of injury, which might promote better results in the long term, since you can stay in the game for longer, and that matters a lot. 3. You won't put yourself at nearly as great a risk of ruining your progress by overtraining. 4. When you cut back on your training, you can emphasize quality over quantity, which can yield superior results. And there's really only one meaningful potential cost of my approach, which is that it may take a bit longer to reach that point of negligible natty progress than Mike's. But I'm not even sure of that, since in proposing that you train more than the pros, Mike really is proposing an absurd amount of training. An amount of training that would be likelier to hamper your progress than accelerate it. The argument in Mike's video lecture for why you should probably train more than the pros is terrible. Mike fails to substantiate many of his claims with evidence, nor does he bother to outline how the pros train 
before he tells you to train like them. He glosses over important physiological differences between natural and enhanced lifters, as if these differences don't impact strongly what enhanced lifters can get away with that naturals simply can't. Mike also never bothers to clarify who you are when he tells you to train more than the pros, or what your goals might be. (laughs) Not only is this irresponsible and lazy, it's also lacking in nuance, which is ironic given that Mike is someone who always prattles on about the importance of nuance. But even for the select few who have the time to train more than the pros, and are after the best results possible. There's still no indication that Mike's approach yields better results. If anything, Mike's approach would be likely to yield worse results due to burnout, injury, overtraining, or having to sacrifice other important training variables for the sake of this silly goal to train more than the pros. I'd caution you to be careful of Mike. Because While much of what he argues is robust and evidence-based, he also has a tendency to give terrible advice and present weak arguments with an air of the utmost confidence and certainty, as if he's reading from the Ten Commandments of bodybuilding. He says things that are sound and things that are unsound with the same level of conviction. So, You should evaluate Mike's claims on their own merits, and not the degree of conviction with which he presents them. Because when you divorce Mike's claims from his authoritative delivery, you can see just how weak they often are. In this video, I presented just one example of this. You can consider subscribing to my channel for more. A personal observation of mine is that Juicers like Mike seem to lose touch with what approaches work best in naturals. They can become zealous about promoting extreme training methodologies and diets that work well for juicers, but leave naturals in ruin. If you're a natural who's after good results, then you can consider getting a consultation with me, a real natural bodybuilder, and not a juiced up con man. My email address is on screen, and further information can be found in the description of this video. If you made it this far, then why not leave the video a like and subscribe to my channel. I'll catch you in the next one.